Hi, everyone. I want to welcome you all to today's book talk for Justin Akers Chacon's new book titled The Border Crust Us, The Case for Opening the U.S.-Mexico Border. Joining me today are Justin himself and New York-based organizer Yanni Guzman, who will we'll have an opportunity to hear from later in the program. But first, I want to thank Haymarket for the invitation and for letting me preview this amazing book. And also for the folks behind the scene, a big thank you to Charlotte and John for putting this event together. I think I'm frozen. Oh, okay, great. Sorry about that, technical difficulties. So I'm going to begin the program today by offering some of my opening remarks um, and my impressions of this book. Um, I wish I had the book here. Let me get up and hold it up. Um, and uh, this remarkable book that is the reason why we're all here and this rich history and also what I think uh, it bears on questions of theory and organization today. So... This book is coming to us at a time when U.S. society enters into this new phase of mass vaccinations. And there's a sense among a lot of people of things going, quote unquote, back to normal or adjusting to a new normal. And uh, that's what at least that's what the management at my workplace, UCLA, where I'm broadcasting from today, has been telling us. So. We have that on the one hand, and then add, that, add to that the fact that the Donald Trump presidency has come to an end for the time being, and we now have a White House and Congress that are both controlled by Democrats. Um, you have this real desire from a lot of people to let out a sigh of relief that the worst of the pandemic and the most vile of bourgeois politics has been quelled or pacified. Sometimes, though not always, it's true of those of us who consider ourselves on the left or even critical of bourgeois politics, unfortunately, there's a real impulse to want to heal and to sort of retreat for a while. So this is the context of this book. But what this book argues, uh, and Justin argues, is it, it urges us to consider that pandemic or not, Democrat or Republican, there are these real infrastructures in place that have been crafted over the course of at least the last few decades that will continue to facilitate this sort of continuity of violence against the working class in general and in a uniquely super exploitative way for those workers who dare to cross borders in search of a better value for their labor power and a better life. Migration is a reality of modern capitalism in North America and globally, and it shows no signs of slowing down. Sometimes, uh, in some cases, we can be expecting more of it as economic and ecological degradation increase. So that's sort of the importance of this book right now. But, but with that said, what is to be done? Uh, many of us, for many of us, it's not enough to just simply wait and see what the Democrats do while they're in power and yes, even the squad, um, not when our neighbors, our classmates, our colleagues, the people in our community are living under this constant threat of detention and deportation for the act of migrating across man-made borders that keep them out all the while allowing capitalism to run freely. So it's not enough for us to accept the status quo and that's why we're here. We have a sort of a bleak picture, um, but some glimmers of hope. And I'll let Justin and Yanni tell us more about those in a bit. Um, but to reiterate, many of us are here because the idea that the border crossed us resonates with our experience. And because we might be asking ourselves, what is the case for opening the U.S.-Mexico border? And how do we organize for that? I'm confident that the two panelists that we have today will give us some answers or at least some thoughts on those questions. And you are here, at least I am, because there's been, um, there has to be some way 
out, right? Some alternative, some way out of this cyclical and cynical cycle of two-party politics in this country. And because we know that there are labor and community organizations, or at least the seeds of organizations, and an emerging socialist consciousness that could potentially be activated in service of opening the U.S.-Mexico border, yeah? And uh, if we only really knew how to effectively make the case for it. And that is our goal today. So if you'll give me permission, I'd like to offer a short um, historical anecdote that speaks to this. And it's a story I didn't know about until a few years ago in my research, which is a story of the sort of one of the organizations of Chicano movement, um, Casa. In 1968, Casa was founded by Bert Corona, Claude Alatorre, and the Mexican American Political Association that was a group aimed at defending immigrant rights and organizing immigrant workers. Laura Pulido talks about this uh, in her book. Um, and it was uh, an, a radical idea because a lot of the unions at the time didn't want to sign on to it. Um, they thought that immigrants were unorganizable and many unions, including the UAW, right, which is a led by Cesar Chavez, who's one of the Latinx Chicano icons of today, believed that immigrant workers were a threat to domestic workers. As Laura Pulido writes in um, her book, Black, Brown, Yellow and Left, she says the unions in the building trades and the metal trades, as well as the big servants unions, would have nothing to do with the undocumented. Their organizers told me that they weren't interested in organizing plants with mostly undocumented workers. They believed that these workers were not organizable because the INS, Immigration and Naturalization Service, would come in and threaten them with deportation and the people would run like quail. This attitude didn't begin to change until we proved during the 1970s that immigrant workers could organize and win contracts. Some of the unions didn't have enough Spanish-speaking organizers. They couldn't communicate the workers. Many of our people could. Pulido's account, and now today we'll hear from Justin, um, are important because these histories push back against harmful forms of nativism um, and anti-immigrant sentiments coming from both, you know, mainstream Chicano and Latinx leadership, uh, like that of the UFW, and also um, nativist, you know, ideas coming from the left. So both Justin and Yanni today will speak to us about the dangerous consequences of this and I think ultimately remind us of this old cliche that's so true that if we don't learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it. So today we're here to hear from our panelists about alternatives to this race to the bottom that can happen through the conscious building up of social work forces of working class power in both the spheres of production and the spheres of reproduction. That is on the factory floor, in the union hall, as well as with neighbors in tenants, uh, in tenants organizations. So I'm really honored to be sharing this platform with them today. And I wanna ask you to please join me in giving a hand to Justin and Yanni. I'll go ahead and introduce Justin first. Today we have uh, Justin Akers Chacon, who's an activist, labor unionist, and educator living in the San Diego Tijuana border region. He is a professor of Chicana Chicano history at San Diego S City College. His most recent book is The Border Crossed Us, The Case for Opening the U.S.-Mexico Border. He's also the author of No One is Illegal with Mike Davis and Radicals in the Barrio. And we also have Yanni Guzman, who is a Chicana living on Lenape land, now known as the Bronx. She has a daughter of immigrant parents indigenous to Mexico and Ecuador. She is a socialist, activist, organizer and rank and file union member and currently she's a tenant organizer and member of the south bronx tenants movement a legal advocate for low-income tenants in the bronx and a member of southern solidarity a grassroots grassroots community-based group of volunteers in solidarity with the unhoused in their quest towards liberation she previously has uh, been a writer, reporter, and website administrator and graphic designer for the Working Class Heroes Radio. 
So I, at home, wherever you are, please join me in giving them a round of applause. I don't know if uh, either of you have anything to add before I ask the question, but if you do, I see I'm nodding. Great, so I'll go ahead and get started with my questions. I'm really excited to chat with you today. My first question is for Justin, um, sort of setting up the book a little bit. So the book is divided into four parts uh, that you can talk about, but I was really interested in the first part of your book where you spend a significant amount of time exploring what you call the North American model of free trade. And I thought it was interesting having read your previous book, Radicals in the Barrio, which is also a really amazing history of transnational and borderland syndicalism and radicalism in the early 20th century. This felt a little bit like a sequel to me. Um, and, and I'll tell you why. Um, specifically because you talk about the North American free trade um, model as um, almost a counter-revolution. And you discuss... Uh, among a lot of things, the the limitations of the Mexican Revolution and the backlash against syndicalism and the co-optation of industrial and agrarian radicalism as like being some of the building blocks and paving the way for the North American model of free trade. Um, can you briefly explain to us how you understand this trajectory towards this like free trade model? And specifically, how do you see uh, in the book, how do you describe this as a kind of counter-revolution against, uh, you know, this earlier moment. Do you agree, I guess, and then if so, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Magali. Um, so, yeah, so um, I guess I would say that, you know, there's a couple there's a couple things to understand about U.S. history that, that can help educate us about what's happening today. Um, one is um, that, you know, the, the, the project of of U.S. capitalism and its development through different periods and phases has always depended on unfree and racialized labor regimes. Uh, you know, of course, starting with uh, the colonization project and uh, the enslavement of peoples and the, and the uh, ex uh, super exploitation of their labor. Um, you know, we can go through we can go through the history. We could see uh, contract labor in which uh, workers, um, you know, especially from Mexico, but other places were were brought in under uh, contracts that basically denied them, um, you know, full rights. Uh, we see uh, the advent of racialized uh, uh, citizen, uh, immigration policies and citizen, citizenship policies and exclusion. We see racialized segregated labor, which creates like caste-like conditions in black and brown and, and indigenous and um, and, and immigrant communities of, of color through much of the uh, you know 19th and 20th century, you know, and most recently I, I would I would say that this as a as a form of continuity, um, the engineering of a large you know a very large population of workers who are absolutely denied uh, the right to citizenship, specifically workers from south of the border uh, and parts of the world you know um, uh, other parts of the world outside outside of Europe. So, um, so that trajectory of unfree labor, I think, is is one thing to understand. The other is that um, that you know the sort of transition to where we are today has also been a reflection of the you know what I would characterize as the crisis-ridden system of capitalism. I mean, you know, the the periods in which there are you know uh, there's expansion followed by periods of 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 deep crisis and 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 within that, looking specifically at the at the current period, we can see that um, the transition towards creating uh, undocumented labor as a significant part of the uh, of the workforce inside the United States really um, fully develops in the 1970s amid um, you know the 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 first profound crisis of capitalism in the United States since World War II. Uh, beginning in the early 1970s, um, and this in this crisis, you know, and I talk about this inside the book. There's there's various effects. One is we see the United States economically losing out, uh, losing you know its sort of pr do a global dominance 
uh, to its rivals in different geographical regions of the world. Um, and we see the, uh, you know, the, a, a consensual turn inside the United States uh, towards what we refer to as neoliberalism, right? The, which is a phase of capitalism um, in which, you know, there's an attempt to extract more wealth from the working class through smashing unions, through, uh, you know, uh, suppressing wages, uh, a variety of things that we've all lived through in our lifetimes. And then that's going to also have a, an external focus, which is, is, which is opening up economies, um, especially in geographic in the, in the periphery of the United States, especially Mexico, opening up these economies um, to gain access to the huge natural resources that exist there, the, the you know, the, the vast working classes, uh, you know, the, the untapped potential. And like, like you had mentioned in, in the question, this, this required an aggressive strategy because Mexico uh, by the 1970s was operating under a system of protection from foreign domination, or at least formally uh, had a protectionist economy rooted in its revolutionary era uh, constitution, which was really uh, designed coming out of the revolution to, uh, to protect Mexico from falling under foreign domination, uh, specifically U.S. domination. So. Um, so the United States, you know, to to open up the economies of the region, um, used its a, a variety of techniques: military intervention, supporting, you know, the overthrow of popularly elected governments, et cetera. In the case of Mexico, it operated through the imposition of free trade policies, through um, essentially uh, debt, and through um, imposing policies on Mexico that that turned it from one of the most Sort of protected economies in terms of its, of its domestic economy to the most open in the world in the matter of four decades. Um, so, uh, so the U.S. you know had to there had to be a number of strategies, and these were bipartisan strategies to essentially to to essentially do that, and and it worked, right? Now, so Me Mexico has more free trade agreements, more o it's more open and exposed to the global economy than than any other country in the world. It has more than twice the number of free trade agreements um, than, than the United States and China combined, to give you a sense of the scale of that. Um, and it had to do this, it had to open it up by facilitating the rise of a capitalist class that, you know, a, a junior, a sort of junior partner to, to the U.S. capitalist class that could also benefit from these changes and uh, a capitalist class that therefore worked hand in glove with the U.S. and um, Operated, you know, in, uh, as its own uh, mirror image. So, so today, for instance, um, Mexico, like the United States of the OECD nations, the richest developed nations, um, United States and Mexico are two of the most are the two most um, unequal per capita. Um, there was a report that just came out of Mexico a couple of days ago that showed that the richest 14 people in Mexico um, control nearly 160 billion dollars. Um, you know, uh, making it the most unequal uh, region of, uh, in the Western Hemisphere um, in, in terms of how wealth is distributed. So this is, this is a, you know, kind of a snapshot of that pro uh, process, how those things came together to, to create a regime that essentially criminalizes uh, the movement of workers, but lifts every possible barrier imaginable to the movement of capital and the qualitative changes that occur uh, out of that out of that process that, that lead us to where we are today. Thank you, Justin. And I didn't mean to, I didn't intend to ask this, but hearing you talk, I also thought it was interesting that you talked about um, just the amount of billionaires in Mexico and the first uh, billionaire in Guatemala, Mario Lopez Estrada. So I thought that was uh, super interesting. I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about the sort of Central American situation and the relationship with that. Yeah, so I mean, I would just add that um, Mexico was a model, the opening up of Mexico, and, and we'll get into, I imagine we'll get into talking about migration and the restructuring of the Mexican economy under this North American model, which serves capital really on both sides of the border, but disproportionately impacts, you know, uh, the, the uh, workers uh, in Mexico, Central America and uh, in the Caribbean, just like undocumented workers here. Uh, but yeah, this model that, um, you know, that was imposed into place again through debt restructuring, uh, the disruption of the, of the political system in Mexico. I mean, we, 
you know, we could talk about the way in which the politics have exploded in, Me in Mexico, going back to the imposition of free trade, political parties um, have risen and fallen, um, social movements have been pers uh, persistent. Um, you know, um, there's a number of layers to how free trade has not just been an economic, but it's had multiple um, political consequent negative consequences for the people. But yeah, this model that we that we see in, introduced and encapsulated in the North American Free Trade Agreement, then added to um, under Trump as the U.S. Mexico Canada Agreement, um, uh, you know, in 2019, uh, the Central American Free Trade Agreement was implemented in 2005, 2006, modeled exactly on what happened in Mexico, and that included uh, most of Central America and parts of the Caribbean. There are other free trade agreements in the Caribbean, like Haiti, that were imposed under the conditions of a dictatorship. So in 1983, uh, the United States, working through the, De the uh, Duvalier dictatorship, the U.S. aligned dictatorship in Haiti, implemented uh, a free trade agreement that radically impacted Haitian, uh, the Haitian economy and Haitian society. So, so the outcome of these uh, these trade agreements has been to radically alter the economies of these countries, displace millions of people, many of whom are now in the United States. The United States has over a hundred, over a million Haitians. It has, you know, large populations of Central Americans and of course, millions of, of Mexicans. So, you know, the, the author uh, Juan Gonzalez wrote a book referring to the harvest of empire, how this, the displacement of peoples at the, at the front end of imperialism, either through military intervention or free trade agreements, essentially, um, you know, creates corridors in which displaced people then come um, to work in the United States, right? So, um, so just to conclude, in Central America, we see the implementation of the Central American Free Trade Agreement, again, modeled exactly on what happened in Mexico, and we see the same results, the creation of a small uh, billionaire, you know, multimillionaire and billionaire class in countries that have tiny economies, right? In countries where there's extreme poverty, where up to two thirds of the population like in El Salvador um, live in poverty, right? And then another million um, El Salvadorians, you know, um, in a country uh, essentially, of, uh, you know, about eight to 10 million people live outside of El, Salvador, uh, El Salvador's uh, borders. So we see, we, see the, we see the poverty, we see the extreme wealth inequality, and then we see mass out migration um, because people can't afford you know, they can't, they don't have, they can't be absorbed into the economy uh, because the economies have been restructured in a way that benefit um, U.S. capital or, you know, U.S. capital in partner with, partnership with local capital. Thank you, Justin. Thanks for entertaining my questions on the spot, on the fly. Um, yeah, so as you mentioned, uh, I actually was going to talk about the new border regime. Um, and this question is sort of is for Justin and also um, Yanni in your organizing work. So I saw the book as contributing um, to this body of work or like emerging body of literature, um, sometimes called border studies, that deals with the ways that um, borders function as this innovative, sometimes called flexible technology of state and capital control, our statecraft to further segment and divide labor. Um, a lot of this work that I was familiar with is um, coming from European folks like Sandro Metzadra and Brett Nielsen, also Sarah Ferris. Um, and so I thought one of the things that's interesting is that you're sort of bringing this um, Marxist analysis uh, of the border to a North American context. Um, in the book, Justin, you talk about uh, a couple of ways that uh, this new border regime functions in terms of, of leveraging the border to maintain differentials of factors, which you discuss as class forces, union density, extant forms of labor repression and control, and other factors that determine wage levels within any particular region or industry. And of course, you also um, spend a significant amount of time in the book towards the end, especially talking about what's been called uh, the construction of illegality, uh, the political construction of illegality. 
um, that sort of has recreated this scenario where even when you're far from the border, um, there is still this uh, disciplining mechanism that happens, functions through the criminalization of undocumented people and threats of, of ICE raids and deportations and detention, um, which you call up the, the migra state, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so can you talk to us a little bit uh, about this bordering as a method of labor discipline and what you think are some of the consequences of this new border regime? And Yanni, um, for you, I am really interested in um, in terms of your tenant organizing. You've talked about the ways that the criminalization of immigration has uh, intersects with the current uh, tenants' rights movements and the so-called housing crisis. Uh, I think your experience like really does a good complementary job to some of Justin's uh, work here, um, specifically thinking about the struggles on what's been called the terrain of social reproduction. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your experience uh, in New York City and what's that been like organizing under this uh, Migra state? I don't know who wants to go first, whoever. Go ahead, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, so so trying to trying to get our our minds around how this grotesque architecture of of you know what amounts to the criminalization of migrant and transnational labor, um, you know. Um, you know, I, I would I would say that this, this de developed in the rhythm of of this sort of formula of the need to accumulate more capital and therefore the need to suppress wages, to to weaken unions, to um, to transfer more public wealth to pr into private hands uh, in order to you know put put more money in the hands of the, uh, of investors and, and global capitalists, et cetera. And so um, I think, you know, there are the threads of history again, which is that in, in the United States, capitalism has always operated under conditions of, of unfree labor, of sections of the, of the working class being, you know, repressed in some legal way. Um, and I would say that um, the way that this current phase of, you know, what really amounts to a, 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 a seemingly unending march towards in, more increased criminalization, more increased border militarization is the, you know, is the logic or illogic, right? I mean, in, in the, uh, from the point of view outside of capital accumulation um, uh, of the way in which immigrant, uh, the way in which labor on, within this North American model has become, you know, how, how there become systems of exploitation, of, of, of increasing exploitation through criminalization on both sides of the border. So on the one hand, you have um, you know, uh, perhaps as uh, as high as 20% of all workers in the United States um, not having full citizenship, you know, from being undocumented to having some kind of temporary status, uh, et cetera. Um, and that's spread across um, industries. And, you know, so the criminalization of migration, essentially the removal of the opportunity of getting citizenship, which places people in conditions of so-called illegality um, has had over the last uh, several decades has had direct consequences, right? So on the one hand, you have um, employers who have the ability to police their own workers who may not have citizenship by threatening to fire them at will, threatening to report them to La Migra, to ICE. Uh, you have, uh, you know, um, those kinds of circumstances where, where essentially the employer, employer has control, you have um, the, the, the use of direct state intervention um, using immigration enforcement to, to deport workers who are trying to organize unions or who, who are trying to support you, you know, support uh, you, uh, some kind of organizing in their workplace. Um, you have the policing of communities by border patrol. You know, uh, ICE now operates within every, every um, Sort of sector of, of the United States, every state. I mean, and so and so. There's a learning process, right? There's like a it's like machine learning within the within within the you know the consciousness of the capital class, which is uh, this leverage uh, to use over a large percentage of workers and leverage to 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 
you know, subdivide and, and separate uh, workers, you know, within this, within this, you know, within the U.S. Uh, economy increases the rate of exploitation of all workers because you, it weakens union density. Um, it, it gives more power to control, um, you know, labor within any given workplace. And so there's a there's a learning that takes place there. So I, I would I would argue that where we're at is the product of sort of the learning of how profitable you know, how important this is for capital accumulation. And then, you know, there's, there's other dimensions. There's the importance of the border enforcement regime to not only, you know, to mark and disempower workers who cross the border and can't get citizenship, but there's a much larger population of workers who can't cross the border for various reasons um, and who are labor markets for you now across the border. And so uh, keeping people contained People um, um, in which a union is very difficult for press, like Central America, even though there are uh, efforts. Okay. okay, so maybe I'll maybe I'll pause here and, and come back. Thank you, Justin. Yanni. Yeah, so thank you so much, uh, Magali, for your question, and Justin as well for your book, which I'll also hold up. <laughs> Hope everyone gets this book. Um, and so I guess I'll borrow some language from the book that I've learned. And, you know, thank you, Justin, for the constant education, you know, but um, just going off of what you were saying, um, and I hope you do come back because I'm, I'm curious to know your thoughts on you know, for people that can't cross the border, right? That are that are stuck in in limbo, um, facing state um, repression from multiple nations, right? Um, but I guess, like for me, when I think about this question, I think like, what does the bordering look like in my community, right? And I encourage everyone to think about what does that look like in their communities. Um, and just like, you know, one thing that I really appreciated, Justin, was that you mentioned that, and I take this as one of the consequences, right, of um, this bordering is um, the and the migra state, you know, um, which uses law enforcement and you know the border regime to create a permanent state of repression. I thought that was really you know interesting, and that permanent state of repression is held through low intensity conflict, right? Um, and um, that's just perpetuating target, uh, perpetually targeting undocumented peoples and workers. Um, and, you know, it creates fear. And like you said, it creates at will workers. Um, so, you know, again, the, the consequences of the migrant state of, of bordering is the control of people, the control of workers, um, because, you know, under capitalism, if you're not working, you know, you, you're not surviving, you're not eating. Um, and I think that, um, like you said, right, um, it the consequence is literally providing this tool right this power to the bosses to the capitalists of, of control over our, our lives and um and when you mentioned you know one example of that is ice calling on workers that are organizing right i mean we see that a lot in new york city and and you know in, in i guess like the work that i do tenant organizing you see um landlords slumlords calling ice on tenants anytime they call 311 for repairs or they decide to organize which you know even though they're undocumented they have that right it is um they're legal right as tenants um and in during the pandemic a lot of the work that i did was um assisting um and, and coming you know I guess, like supporting tenants through illegal evictions during, um, or despite the moratorium um, in New York City, because some lords were just wanted their money and they realized, oh, you're undocumented. I'm going to call ICE, right? Because um, not only um, is ICE deporting and displacing people that way, right, through raids, um, but also some lords are displacing people using ICE. So the displacement that, you know, furthers gentrification in our communities is not just, OK, we're just going to evict you and you'll be on the streets and that's it. It's like, no, we'll evict you and we'll just and you'll be deported. So that's that double layer of displacement. Um, and, you know, another another, um, I guess, consequence, right, of the bordering in in my experience has been, you know, the um, immigration, right, which is uh, the intersection between law enforcement and immigration and uh, homeland security, border patrol. And 
we saw that we see this constantly. And one one example is um, in the case of Javier Castillo Maradiaga, which is a Bronx side that um, um, Dariela, um, which is Javier's sister, and I, we we teamed up and and you know we really worked to free him from ICE detention, and we stopped his deportation three times. Um, but why was he detained? Because he was jaywalking, right? So we see another consequence where the we see uh, New York City stop and frisk laws, just um, which are you know very uh, racial racialized and and. Um, and there's big, you know, strong movements, Black Lives Matter, you know, anti-policing, decarceration movements that are specifically talking about these kind of the policing and, and the p- police uh, brutality. Um, and but, but we see that as well, where Javier was stopped for jaywalking and instead of getting a ticket, he was arrested. He was, um, you know, thrown in jail. And then the court system handed him over to ICE. Right. Um, because even though we're in a sanctuary city, um, you know, uh, they ended up just giving him over and, and that's it. And when we demanded justice, they seriously just said, well, we don't know what you're talking about, but it's like, how does ICE then get a hold of Javier? Right. There is that share of information happening. Um, and you know, for me, like a consequence is that just that policing is extending that, right? Like policing has many arms and it's not just about like policing, um, you know, people incarcerating, it's literally about, again, like what Justin said, controlling people. And so ICE is another extension of that. Um, And I guess like, you know, one thing that really like a consequence, right, of of this border regime is um, protecting or reinforcing national boundaries, right? Reinforcing what citizenship is and who has it and who doesn't. And and I think that we see that a lot um, and just a lot of fear going on in the city, you know, during the pandemic, um, a lot of people didn't want to speak up because, you know, uh, of what was going on in their families, their struggles, because they, you know, hold this guilt that society has told, you know, has given to them through this, you know, um, repression that you're not worth this and you don't deserve that and you can't access, you know, support. And so I think that that was one of the things that I, that really that I that I struggled with in the pandemic, just seeing how many undocumented peoples were dying, right? Uh, were dying. I, that's a real consequence. That violence is the consequence of that bordering. Um, and you know, having workers rise up and say, "Hold up, no, we actually create most. We create this value, right? We are creating the profits. These people are the whole, you know, exclude. What is it? Um, essential workers, right? Versus non-essential workers. We are essential workers. We are the reason why the city is still moving. Why are we not getting our cut? Where is our help, right? Where is our assistance? We're drowning. And so I think that for me, that was really key in our organizing during a pandemic. Seeing these workers kind of make those connections and saying, okay, yes, we're afraid, but if we don't do this, if we don't organize, we're gonna die. And I think that that for me was just inspiring to see people actually stand up. And we see this during, um, you know, the delivery workers strike in New York City and the movements. We see this during the the vendors um, and, and, you know, having all of these excluded workers come together to demand um, excluded workers pay, to demand their their what the city owes them, right? What this country owes them because they built this wealth. No one's giving them anything. This is wealth that they created. Um, and so, yeah, in my experience, I, I just see the bordering, right, which is uh, has a hundred miles jurisdiction. A lot of people think, oh yeah, the crisis at the border is at the border. No, that's that violence at the of the border, right? And this, you see it in our communities when ICE is literally raiding workplaces, when they're, you know, doing the work of slumlords and and marshals evicting people, um, when they're just intimidating and policing people, just like the NYPD is. Um, that, that violence, that consequences, we see that every day. This is uh, uh, this is in our communities, and my, maybe people don't know about it, but that's just because you're not talking to people, right? And and maybe people don't want to share too much because by just sharing, that's a vulnerability, right? All of a sudden, people say, "I have a target on my back because you know something that could, you know, if I say something and or maybe you don't like." You, you know, you can report me to ICE. And that I feel like that's another consequence, literally not only just giving this power to bosses, but giving this power to individuals, right? That 
like what Justin said, you know, um, and what Magali, you mentioned, you know, having this idea that, you know, undocumented people are stealing jobs, that they're bad, they're a safety concern, and, and the rhetoric that we hear constantly to justify the border, um, to justify this MIGA state and, and the bordering, right? That itself, it, it, you know, it's a vulnerability. So there's also people, individuals that are ready to just call ICE and make a report. And ICE encourages that, right? Um, and, you know, another example that I think about that is just Texas and the abortion ban, right? Like encouraging people to just call up on women and call up and snitch on women and saying, oh, yeah, this is happening. It's the same thing. ICE encourages that. too. So I think that like in a lot of our organizing, it's important to um, identify the many ways, the consequences of the border regime in our community. What does that manifest like? What does that look like? So that we can then combat it and we can be very conscious in the way that we move you know, um, creating a, a, a safe space for people to be able to find their voice, to develop their leadership um, skills and organizing style, and to really push forward um, and, and make sure, you know, keeping all of this in mind, really knowing the vulnerability, but also the power that comes when we are together, united and saying enough. And we've seen that during the pandemic. So that's really exciting for me. Thank you, Yanni. Uh, I need to get that thing that you just said on a t-shirt recognize the consequences of the border regime in your own community because I think that's super powerful and yeah I, I hearing you talk um makes me feel like absolutely we've just kind of come out of this like very big spectacle of the border crisis right like all this um you know in the news the news about um, Haitian migrants recently, and then the news about Central American migrants earlier last year and in the last few years, um, it tends to create the spectacle. And what you're talking about is like, yes, that's definitely horrific, but there are also these sort of deep infrastructural um, reasons for this. And, and you know, we need to kind of, we, we're radicals, <laughs> we attack it at the root. So, um, that has me thinking about um, the Donald Trump spectacle, right? Uh, this book is not necessarily specifically about the Donald Trump presidency, but a lot of us are lived through it, you know, and it was a very spectacular moment in a lot of ways because of Trump's particular style of fascist populism and then sort of this transition to a Joe Biden presidency. But Justin, what I found interesting about your book is that you often uh, do this work of sort of discussing opposing parties together, such as when you say that, uh, quote, the war on immigrant labor that began under Bush was intensified and expanded under Obama and Trump, and it signified the consensual end of amnesty as a negotiable political idea for the U.S. capitalist class. So we have the spectacle of like, you know, the end of the border regime of the Trump uh, presidency and, you know, Joe Biden. And also, um, I think every couple of years when it's election season, um, someone somewhere, uh, there's another spectacle, right? A political spectacle of introducing comprehensive immigration reform. And we're experiencing that right now. Um, I, I know there's a couple of people in uh, Congress trying to introduce comprehensive immigration uh, reform at the time. So, you know, putting that against you saying that there's a consensual end of amnesty um, as a negotiable idea, there's still this idea of this every once in a while, or like DACA, right? Or Trump's attacks on DACA. Um, as as politics, like just a spectacle of politics. So my question is, in your opinion, both of you, I'm curious to know if we're doomed to repeat this particular Groundhog Day nightmare of bourgeois politics forever, where every couple of years, you know, comprehensive immigration reform is on the agenda and nothing happens, um, or DACA is under attack, et cetera. And, you know, we're here because we're specifically talking about this policy, let's call it, of opening up the U.S.-Mexico border. So in the context of, you know, this sort of cynical, cyclical politics, you know, what does it mean to say that we want to open the U.S.-Mexico border? Um, is, it, is it an actual 
um, thing, a policy that we want to be put on the agenda? Or is it more kind of like a speculative thing, something to rally um, those of us in the room? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, I'll try to tie in what I was going to say earlier to this because I think it's relevant, um, you know, when my mic cut out, which is, um, you know, the, the, the criminalization of labor in the United States. And Yanni spoke, excellent, you know, very well to, you know, the real lived experiences of people under this criminalization regime. Um, in the book, I look at I look at about four you know, 30 to 40 years worth of research um, that um, studies uh, the, the the various effects of migrant worker criminalization. Um, and it's very clear in, in the data that that this that that the more you repress labor, migrant labor through border enforcement and the, the denial of citizenship, the, the there's a correlation with declining wages, declining rates, of, of unionization and not just for the repressed worker, but for all workers, right? And so, and so, you know, what this gets at is that it's not just a regime of cruelty for cruelty's sake, it's a regime of cruelty that has very significant economic multiplier effects for capital. Um, and this is, you know, sort of gets at, um, you know, why the, why the regime is in place, why the border is maintained, why um, and how this is extended across the region um, and how this as a method of both capital accumulation within the United States from investments in Mexico, Central America and the Caribbean um, through the financialization of these economies. And we haven't even talked about, you know, U.S. capital is heavily concentrated in Mexico, heavily concentrated, including through the financial sector. And there's there's profit flows coming out of you know, so so this is such a it's such a central part of how capitalism operates that it deforms the political system, right? And 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 that, and that kind of gets at the question. It deforms it in the sense that that you you can you can see that capital has closed, you know, sort of sort of narrowed the terrain in which the two capitalist parties can operate when it comes to um, free trade and immigration enforcement because it's all, it's all part of a setup. That has developed over these over a few decades that has become extremely uh, profitable and necessary for capitalism to function the way it does today. So when we talk about like um, you know Biden, you know um, doing the same thing that that the Obama administration. And remember, Biden was Obama's vice president for two two terms. So he's not this is Biden isn't a new player. In fact, Biden his fingerprints the. Uh, on every single immigration criminalization bill going back to Operation Gatekeeper are, are you know, neat. They're, they're present and they're all over. Um, he has been a champion of, of uh, migrant criminalization. He has been a champion of the, of the, of the border enforcement regime. Um, but, but the way in which we see a recycling, as you say, the Groundhog Day phenomenon of the promise of immigration reform and followed quickly by the abdication and abandonment of it almost, you know, you know, now with, with under Biden, we see it happen really quickly. Um, the, the first day in office, Biden introduced uh, uh, an immigration reform that wasn't really a reform as the way we understand it, but, um, but contained the language of a path to legalization. I, I wrote about this, I called it the sort of labor, the, the, the chain gang path to, 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 to citizenship in which citizenship is virtually impossible under, under the terms. But even that was not enough, and and so when we when we when we look at the narrowing of even the the performance of going through, you know, the, the how much the the political parties, in, in particular the Democrats, are are willing to even go through in order to to create the impression that they're fighting for immigration reform, it begs the question: Why? What what is happening? You know, that is that is that is leading to this kind of. Um, you know, you know, virtual abandonment of, of any kind of a move towards um, any progressive re reform of immigration. So um, I think that has to do with, again, how, it, how it's rooted. The economy, the, the, the political economy is shaped by the way capitalism operates and the Democratic Party is becoming less and less willing uh, to, to act. But nevertheless, there has to be the, pre the presentation of opposition. And so after, after four years of Trump, 
right? In which, uh, to be clear, Trump didn't, there was no significant immigration legislation passed under Trump. What Trump did was essentially operate through executive order and in intensify the cruelty and the repression through over, you know, 400 executive orders, many, uh, many of which had to do with just intensifying the existing policies. Um, but, you know, but, but there was damage done, right? I mean, th this was a horrible period of time for people I mean, we saw the the eradication of of um, more or less our our asylum seeking system. You know, a, a basic human rights framework towards asylum seekers as and refugees has been more or less um, uh, dismantled. Um, we we've seen a lot of things happen under Trump. So so there was a lot of opposition. There was a lot of protest. We uh, probably before we end, we'll talk about some of the struggles that happened under Trump that were really significant and showing how. Organized labor moved into, you know, move, in different ways, moved into the struggle against Trump's intensification of the border regime. Uh, and so there had to be the presentation of an alternative, right? And so the Democrats offered that, but they moved away from it very quickly um, and and abandoned it at this point. And in fact, um, the the Biden administration, with the the you know more or less the quiet complicity of the rest of the Democratic Party at the national level has basically uh, continued much of the Trump era ex executive orders, has, has more or less kept much of that machinery, machinery intact. So we have to see it as, as two things. One is that narrowing of, of what's possible um, within the political terrain, within the political arena, that as it you know, potentially comes in conflict with the way capitalism operates. But we also see a, a kind of political crisis emerging um, because the theatrics of, of, of promising that you're going to fight for immigration reform, and then after three presidential cycles and abandoning it, um, you know, when you have the majorities, when you have the political uh, mandate, when you have the, you know, the numbers to do it, um, you know, that's creating a dissonance amongst a larger segment of the population who basically, you know, uh, it, it can't be explained, right? And so, and so either we become demoralized or we become more uh, aware of, of, you know, what's actually happening. And so the slogan of opening the border, I'll talk about this more <laughs> in, a, in a minute, but the slogan of opening the border isn't just a, a, a piece of rhetoric. It's, it's a recognition of the way struggle, the way the, the trans, the way the economy is being transnationalized and workers are being brought into essentially the same industries, the same working for the same companies, working along the same logistical transportation nodes, the way and the way we're seeing flashes of struggle, cross-border and transnational struggle, because the workers already are, you know, in some cases, understanding that and recognizing the way this system has fused them into a sort of common, uh, a common economic relationship uh, within capitalism. That, that, is, that is what's happening in this book is an attempt to just point that out for people who haven't been able to see, to see that. This is already in motion and, and you know, it, it's time for the rest of us to sort of recognize that and that should guide also how we organize, how, you know, how we understand the, the role of the border and how we understand how we can begin to dismantle it. But it's not gonna be just by voting and, and sitting back, right? I mean, in fact, voting uh, can be very demoralizing when you see nothing come out of it except further further um, criminalization, further perpetuation of, of, of you know, the border and, and various capacities uh, and, and the expansion of ICE, et cetera. And so we have to look to other other ways to begin to see how that becomes possible. Yeah, and I mean, I totally agree with you, Justin. I won't add much, but I just wanted to kind of piggyback of what you were last saying, that it has to inform how we're organized, right? And like voting is not enough and it will never get there, get, get us there because as you said, um, you know, legaliz legalization, right? What does that do? It diminishes um, employers' advantage, right? Through loss of control of the workers, right? And both the government, both parties, right? They will never willfully make that happen. They just won't. And so, you know, it's not in their class interest. So we need to start thinking of ourselves as a class, right? We need to start developing that class consciousness um, and understanding that they're just not gonna legislate um, any sort of path to citizenship, any sort of amnesty, any sort of comprehensive, you know, immigration reform, and and I and I think that like the frustration is, you know, we've seen that we've seen with that when they do introduce something, it's very, you know, it's 
it's it's a false right like what, what you said it's very it's um it's not actually something it's not an amnesty it's not actually something for for undocumented peoples to be able to be free, right? It doesn't provide that freedom. Um, it's very illusionary, like DACA, right? The fact that it's constantly being con contested and and people, it's like cyclical. They see DACA recipients and dreamers see themselves like wondering what's gonna happen, uh, you know, what's my life gonna be if they take away DACA, right? It's like it's a building a life. Uh, what is it on a a house of cards? At any moment, everything could just fall apart. And I think that we're tired of that, right? We see that constantly, that any time they introduce something or they want to talk about it, it's some sort of workers program, right? Oh, you have to give us your blood, sweat, and tears more than what you already do to get something very minuscule. minuscule. And at the same time, there's so many concessions. What do we always see whenever, you know, in these um, bills or policy? There's always further criminalization, further, you know, bloating the budgets of ICE, Border Patrol, like um, extending and redefining what is a crime, who is a criminal, so that at the same time, while they're giving crumbs to some people, they're literally criminalizing thousands more, right? Um, creating new categories and further division. Um, and what you said, you know, further um, international policies, right, um, that, that continue to exploit um, and squeeze. And, 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 you know, like I guess you you mentioned in your book, like a recolonization of these other countries. So that's what we see. And so it's just not going to happen. I don't believe that we're ever going to have that unless we decide to say enough. We want this today and we organize. And what you said, you know, the, the labor movement has to flex, has to say, OK, hold on. Um, I think you said you mentioned something in your book that I thought was just really amazing. The fact that every aspect of, you know, this migra state is um, is the product of the labor of undocumented peoples from the food right from the food that they serve the furniture that they make for the housekeeping in these facilities every product right like the um surveillance you know it's like tech created by you know families of uh you know of undocumented peoples um and once we realize that if we actually want it to stop this, you know, we could just withhold our labor. We can very consciously look, consciously look at how our labor is complicit in creating the migra state, upholding the migra state, right? And if we were to say enough, then there will be changes because just, you know, the, I think you said something about, um, you know, it upholds it. And so once we realize how vulnerable it is, then it will just fall apart. And I think that we're not going to have comprehension reform or we're not going to have some sort of amnesty or anything like that or free people, right? Open borders until we ourselves decide enough and, and, and make it to the point that we disrupt society and the economy to the fullest extent that they're just going to have to do what we say. I mean, and we don't even need them, right? We take over. So I, I definitely don't see that happening anytime soon unless we as the workers, the working class and, and you know, um, folks that don't work, right, because of disability, because of all these other reasons, um, because they've been so marginalized that they can't even partake, right, in in working, we decide that's it, enough. In fact, we don't even want to work, <laughs> right? There has to be no condition. We don't need any conditions to live our life and be humans and, and just be free. Amen. Like, all right, that's it. Everybody can go home. No, um, thank you, Yanni and Justin. I feel like we are starting to get a little bit into um, a quest the question of what kind of concrete organizing is po is possible today, and and you will see. But um, yeah, Justin, you talk, you know, to tip the scales, because Justin, in the book, you write that the future of organized labor is depending on expand, dependent on expanding the rights for immigrants, while the future of capitalism is depending or dependent on curtailing them. Both cannot proceed in parity, but only in conflict with one another. At the present, these forces are greatly imbalanced, and we've been talking quite a bit about that with state repression expanding into the 21st century behemoth and the organized labor movement at one of its lowest ebbs in history. That was um, even more the case during the pandemic. Um, but we might be seeing like a strike wave. I'm uh, broadcasting live from UCLA 
and you know our UCAFT, our lecturers are about to go on strike, and you know the um, IAASTE uh, Hollywood workers are also on strike. So I'm like, is this? Are we seeing a new strike wave possibly? Um, and I think this is really important. Uh, an important takeaway from your book, Justin, you make this very almost maybe provocative point that the failure of organized labor to stand up for immigrant workers, and especially after 9-11, in the face of this kind of increasing uh, increasing raids and deportation, have actually also opened the door for expanded state repression and right-wing attacks, um, the, the decline of unionization. So I wanted to see if you can expand upon that a little bit more, what you mean by that, uh, and what you see as a sort of short and long-term effects. And then, you know, on a more kind of, on a less bleak note, um, you also um, suggest different uh, areas of potential hope in terms of working class self-activity, the new, so a new socialist consciousness, uh, which we haven't talked a lot about, but I was like, where does the squad and like, you know, DSA and all that kind of fall into this? Obviously, uh, Yanni and others have talked about Black Lives Matter. So the question is for both Justin and Yanni, right? Like what what present current social forces in society do you see that could serve as this kind of raw material for tipping the scales in the direction of the working class? What is the, what's exciting you in the present about um, labor organizing or community organizing, et cetera? Yeah, there's a lot to say here. Um, I think it's important to recognize um, that that you know, with the onset of criminalization of migration, which really, you know, I document this in the book in terms of how we see it correlate to the economic, global economic crises of the 1970s. And by the late 1970s, we see a significant shift within US politics coming through the two political parties um, towards the, you know, this idea of opening Mexico, towards the idea of recognizing migration and then, and then even discourse about Seeing this migration as a threat, right? Before, long before 9/11, long before, um, you know, the war on, you know, the sort of war on drugs rhetoric that um, fueled the, the the physical, the, you know, the Operation Gatekeeper and the and the physical uh, bordering of the, of the U.S.-Mexico border, we see the, the the inner politics in the United States begin to shift in this direction, um, and and I document that by 1986 when we see the Immigration Reform and Control Act. Um, you know, there there was an immigrant rights movement. There was some labor organizing with undocumented workers that was, in many ways, revitalizing organized labor after you know decades of decline uh, and, and and defeat. Um, and um, you know, and and we see organized labor sections of it pulling you know the national AFL CIO into supporting undocumented workers. And by 1986. Um, supporting and calling for an amnesty, right? Um, because there was the recognition that these workers were more likely to join unions, were um, were being held back by criminalization and being undocumented. Um, there were a lot of things that happened with that Immigration Reform and Control Act, but the, but the thing I want to emphasize is that it did open up an amnesty. And between 1986 and the mid-90s, over that decade, we saw three million, at least 3 million people be legalized, not some path to legal, you know, not some like you have to do a hundred different things to qualify and, and, and maybe you'll get disqualified, but an amnesty where people saw, were able to legalize their status, um, you know, in a fairly short order. And what happened? Well, the unions actually facilitated that. And so um, many of those people, you know, poured into the union and it, it kicked off a very exciting chapter of labor history where even at the top of the AFL CIO, they, they changed their, you know, in 2000, they changed their perspective, no longer calling for immigration, you know, restrictions and, and criminalization of migration. Um, for the most part, beginning to deploy the rhetoric of like, we need to have more amnesty, we need to have more legalization, uh, because, you know, because the free trade phenomenon and the displacement that went with it continued, right? And even more people came as undocumented workers after uh, NAFTA uh, passed. Um, you know, in the 90s um, through the 2000s. And, you know, like I already mentioned in, with the other free trade agreements. Um, after 9-11, we see, for various reasons, we see a complete retreat, okay? And 
And organized labor by 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 2003 basically leads the field. And I and I talk about this in the book in terms of understanding how a um, the 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 entrance of organized labor added a, a powerful dimension that can contest power with the capitalist class. And um, and we see within that period of time uh, the closing of ranks. Of capital, I give lots of examples of how people, how the, the capitalist class uh, was thinking and talking about no more amnesty, right? No more amnesties. We got to close that off. And how we see both, the, you know, of course, the Republican Party, but the Democratic Party closing ranks behind that, um, and and ultimately, organized labor withdrew withdrew from that and and began to take, you know, uh, to move to the to the sidelines on this question. So by 2005, we see the intensive uh, criminalization, the most intensive criminalization package being introduced with the Sensenbrenner King Bill. And we see, you know, the fight for legalization and amnesty now shifting to the immigrant workers themselves, right? With the mass marches of 2006, uh, uh, you know, and the immigrant rights movement movement coming out at that point. The state counterattack smashed worker or immigrant worker organization across the country, deported thousands and then hundreds of thousands and since then millions of people effect effectively dismantling um, the, the organized uh, you know, sort of movement that came out of that. Um, so so, so that, that's like a, the end of a cycle, right? Um, but we've seen, uh, we've seen the reemergence of, of, um, of struggle now in, in different ways. And, and, I'll, and I'll you know, I have more to say about this, but, but I'll conclude by, by giving a couple of examples. Um, we've seen um, the revitalization of struggle in Mexico. So it, in the book, I talk about, you know, almost industry by industry, how much Mexico's economy is now more or less fused or into the U.S. economy uh, through, you know, the same through through the same companies in some cases, through some industries that are linked. So, for instance, the, the auto industry, Mexico now has half of the North America's auto workers in it. Right. Um, and North America is you know, one of the primary auto production zones in the world. Um, so much of production has shifted to Mexico. GM operates plants. Most of the, of the, U, uh, the U.S. and international uh, car manufacturers operate production facilities, but they also have what's called supply chain production, um, um, you know, in the Mexican economy where they produce parts of cars, you know, and then they either get shipped to the U.S. or Europe or Asia to be put into the, into the, into the complete car, but they also have whole production facilities in Mexico now. And starting in 2019, we see strikes um, being organized by rank and file uh, committees in these auto part maquiladoras, these auto part production plants, especially on the Mexican side of the border, you know, in the state of Tamaulipas, for instance. Um, uh, we see wildcat strikes breaking out after, you know, after some, some years of organizing uh, from the bottom up, we see um, we see a, you know uh, one of the most significant um, uh, independent union movements happening right now in the state of Guanajuato in the GM plant, the General Motors plant that uh, that makes you know produces whole cars, whole you know it's a it's a, it's a state of the art 21st century facility, and we see workers trying to organize an independent union. They just successfully threw out a fake company controlled union. Um, and these workers have been calling and trying to establish solidarity with U.S. auto workers. Uh, 2019, GM went on strike um, across uh, uh, the United States, and you know that shut down parts of Canada. And the, U the UAW extends between the United States and, and Canada, but it doesn't extend to Mexico. And so when GM went on strike, you know, uh, and I talk about this in the book. One of the strike demands was to keep facilities in the United States because GM was moving more and more production to places like Mexico. And um, when they went on strike, Mexican workers at a GM plant, the same GM plant in, in Guanajuato and in, in, in a, in a, a, a place called Silao, um, they said, why don't we all go on strike? Because they had been organizing to, to create this independent union. Why don't we all go on strike and we can make common demands including no shifting, you know, more job, more U.S. jobs to Mexico in, a, in an act of solidarity. So in other words, you support us, we'll support you. We have a common cause here. Um, the United Auto Workers leadership, you know, did not accept that um, offer and, and ultimately accepted a concessionary contract 
um, you know, but but there are there are these examples across various industries, across various, um, you know, um, even within the same workplace. Walmart workers went on strike in Mexico and won, or or you know, we're, we're threatening to go on strike in one major concessions from Walmart at a time when the Walmart workers are trying to organize here. The last example I'll give is uh, I live in the San Diego Tijuana border region, and just in the last few months, last two months, uh, Amazon has opened up two mega facilities, one in Tijuana, one about 10 minutes where I live from where I live, and one on the U.S. side, just about five minutes from where I live. And they're, the, they're essentially the same. They're called fulfillment centers. They're these mega warehouse uh, centers where they store uh, Amazon products and the drivers distribute them. They built them five miles away from each other, right, across the border. The workers do the same jobs, but in Tijuana, they get paid $1 an hour. And in San Diego, they get paid $18 an hour. And they're situated right across the border corridor called Otay Mesa so that they can move their products between facilities very easily, but the workers can't, right? And what's happening right now in the United States is there's a Teamster election. Teamster has been, Teamster Union has been trying to organize, uh, not successfully, but trying to organize Amazon workers. And right now there's a Teamster sort of election with a, with a, major debate happening within that union about, you know, future, you know, strategies for, for organizing and, and winning, including the organization of Amazon. Well, we, we need to include in that discussion why it's urgent to organize workers in Tijuana doing the same work as workers, workers five miles across the border in San, in San Diego, because as long as that border divides, that will keep wages at $1.25 an hour in Mexico and $18, you know, that differential will actually pull, pull both wages down over time because that that arrangement serves to benefit Amazon and not the workers working for them. Okay, um, I guess I'll just be quick because um, I think that this is really interesting and we're talking more about like international labor solidarity and I, I, I know people want to hear more about that. I just wanted to share a little bit about just local, I'm about to make it local, community organizing, um, just on the other side of that. Um, I think that, you know, Justin in, in the book mentioned that one of the ways forward is to, um, is for people, uh, right, besides labor organizing, right, and labor, um, uh, I guess, organizing undocumented peoples, um, is for... Um, communities, right? People people that are willing, that are dedicated to consciously building up social forces and organizational capacity um, to, you know, can make the case for open borders and fight for it. And, you know, this is happening in the streets, in our communities, um, you know, and I think that that's kind of like the kind of work that I've been doing or, or that I strive to do with uh, my comrades in the South Bronx. And one of the ways in which we're doing that is through tenant organizing. Um, you know, uh, because of, I mentioned earlier that I, I was connected to tenants during the pandemic that were um, illegally being evicted. And one of those tenants and all of them had some sort of connection to ICE rates or, you know, detention. And one of those tenants, um, you know, ha had fought for the freedom of her partner. Um, and so I, I connected with them and we were able to organize a tenant association. And now this tenant association um, is not only fighting for, um, you know, uh, better living conditions, but also it, um, it's creating a network of ice watch in their community. And this network of ice watch has, you know, people in the building that has experienced raids, but also people across the street that work in La Panaderia, people that work in La Floreria, street vendors on the corner, you know, like it's a, it's becoming a network of workers, undocumented workers, indigenous workers that are, are you know, um, experiencing displacement, gentrification, experiencing this violence, right, this migra state violence, and are saying enough, we have to do something about it. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of power in that. And, and, and if we're able to, you know, get these other people or to organize tenant associations as well, then hopefully the goal is to have a block association, right? Can you imagine the power that comes in having a block association where you make a case for open borders, where you say, no, this is, you, we're here as tenants, as workers, you know, we put on all our hats as consumers, producers, all of that, right? And say, what, how are we complicit or how can we fight back and, and our capacities and the where does our power lie so that we as a block, as a community, right, can continue to grow and build our power so that we can effectively kick out ice, right? So that we can um, 
kick us eyes out of our community and and join you know the ranks of people that are doing this work nationwide that are doing this work and locally you know so we can join and provide transportation to people that are hunger you know that are going to support hunger strikers in new jersey where our family members are being you know kidnapped and taken to right or how can we join the networks of you know um you know, national organizers that, you know, so that we can be connected to our family members that are being kidnapped and taken to Louisiana, to Texas, to all these other, you know, states that where people don't have those connections or support system. So the idea of if we can organize in our community and our block and our, uh, you know, our neighborhoods, we can perhaps run these, you know, and, and I'm not all for electoral politics, but, you know, it's a tool. We can run these tenants, these donors um, on these, you know, tickets for first local power as well and and make sure that the, the politics that we're pushing through are the politics of these tenant associations, are, are these undocumented workers are, you know, so that we can respond to the needs um, that, that that we see in, in our community. And so, I think that as well, you know, um, undocumented people, the communities have taught me so much. They're very resilient, right? Um, I don't like this, you know, when people talk about this victimization of of people's. No, these people are resilient. They have strong networks, you know, mutual aid networks, because they know that in this country, that's how you survive, right? You survive by taking care of each other because no one's going to give you anything. Um, everything is just being taken from you. And so I think that if we're able to work with communities, tap into those networks, right? And and provide resources, access to resources, provide um, our networks, our skills as organizers, as advocates, and allow them to grow and, and, and you know, talk politics, you know, have political education, um, provide language access. People can just take the reins. People can do this work. They're already doing it, right? They're doing it with, it, with us or without us. Um, and so I just think that it's very important to put that power on these people and provide that it's that support. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about is ICE and and just like how it's been used, right, as a tool after 9-11 to detain and torture Muslim people, right? Uh, like Justin said, against immigrant workers during the 2006 strikes um, as strike breakers, which by the way, I was like 13 years old when that was happening. And I dragged my mom, my tias, and I'm like, listen, we gotta be there. This is the first time I feel proud of who I am. And I want you to feel that pride, you know? Um, you know, ICE has also been used as uh, against political leaders, Black Lives Matter leaders, right? In, in, this, in these fights. And so, you know, they're being used by all capitalists to protect their interests. And how do they how do they work, right? They built paramilitary bases in communities. They develop methods of surveillance and tracking, right? Um, and then extract people, they kidnap people, right? Um, without disrupting social and economic functions. And so we have to, you know, build community um, and, and organize our communities who are not who are willing not only to defend people but go on the offensive. We need to find a way to go on the offensive and not just respond to crises is happening left and right. You know, we need to build that capacity to go on the offense. Um, and what does that look like? I don't know. You know, um, I'm thinking we have to make ice operation ice operations um, impossible to to happen to be carried out. Um, we need to identify these paramilitary bases, right? And, 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 and unite with labor to make sure that they cannot actually, you know, function, that they're inoperable. We need to then, you know, continue to unite with labor to make sure we shut down their surveillance and their tracking, right? And this is a connection of, like I said, little vecindarios, neighborhood, ice watch in communication with organized labor to do this, right? Um, and we need to, um, again, we, we need to create these networks so that, that way we can make sure that our people are not being kidnapped. And when our people are kidnapped, we make it, you know, if ICE is trying to make everything happen, you know, by without disrupting social and economic functions, then we disrupt that, right? We make it as loud as possible. And I think that that is a way in which we can fight locally. And I've seen that in New York City. I've seen that in Queens, our comrades in, you know, um, in Brooklyn and Sunset Park. They've been an inspiration doing this work. Um, our from comrades from New Jersey, literally traveling all the way to our communities to make sure to, to, to do that ice watch. Um, and New York City ice watch was created a year ago due to the inspiration that they see in Queens and Brooklyn rising and saying, we need to have ice watch in every single neighborhood. So that now, 
you know, we are prepared to respond. We're tired of just always being on the defensive. We need to go on the offense. And, you know, New York City Ice Watch currently has like about 22 chats, um, you know, because everyone's on WhatsApp, <laughs> 22 chats. Um, of That means 22 communities that have are self-organizing. And so when we get a message saying so-and-so um, saw ice here, we were able to respond quickly. So we're building rapid response networks. And that's another way that we can fight back. And these rapid response networks are showing us really that we don't, we, we're not living in scarcity. There's abundance, right? So if somebody is facing an eviction, we have people that are doing eviction defense and obviously the cops are there. So we have cop watch, right? And, you know, if ICE is there, we have ICE watch. And if someone is evicted or, you know, someone's family got taken and now they can't feed themselves, we have mutual aid organizations. You know, we, we can literally tap into the community networks that we have that, that, that are being created for our survival and that we, you know, and that we pretty much take that to the offensive instead of just, de uh, you know, defending each other. But th that's just really what I was thinking about. Um, and I guess I get just one last point. If labor doesn't organize undocumented peoples like they did in 1986, we're going to have nonprofits doing that work. Nonprofits are going to just come in on an individual basis and depoliticize people. And and that's very key. You know, um, it, if we're not doing that work, someone else will do it. Um, Yanni, I think this is awesome. You gave me two more slogans that I'm like gonna take with me. Power to the Las Donas is one of them. And then the revolution will be on WhatsApp. So thank you for that. Um, it's really inspiring. Okay, so people should obviously go out and buy the book, but you know, it's also true that some of our viewers right now are organizers in their workplace and their communities and socialist groups, tenant organizations, and they can't exactly walk around with the book and say like, here, this is a case for open borders, right? Like read the book. So what would you say to an organizer who has been thinking about these things for a while, but hasn't necessarily maybe had the language in the past to articulate this basically in a sentence or two? make the case for opening the U.S.-Mexico border. Sentence or two. So the border regime and all of its tentacles are an attack on all labor. Opening the border means building solidarity. Very concrete, it means defending people from La Migra. And opposing La Migra, it means building common unions, common contracts with workers that are doing the same work. It means building the labor movement, building workers' power. And, you know, it means challenging the way in which capitalism is oppressing us through these, through the, the border regime, through all of its tentacles of, of uh, migrant repression, because that's an attack on all of us. It's, it's an attack that we even see, as Yanni has pointed out, we even see it expressing itself now with ICE, um, uh, you know, um, attacking dissenters and di disappearing and arresting people in protests. And the way that ICE is even, um, you know, the, the, the trajectory of development of ICE, on the one hand, it's a massive money maker for big, for capital. On the other hand, it's a, it's a, it's an institution that is evolving into, um, you know, a kind of proto-fascist, you know, um, enforcement gendarme. You know, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, there's, there's been a lot of discussion about, about it becoming something to be used against labor in general or, or, or protests in general. I mean, you know, there's, a, there's a lot written about that. I don't know if that's a couple sentences, but uh, I think that would be the, the, the essence of it. And I just want to say one more thing, um, you know, because when we talk about realism, political realism around this issue, you know, I, I think I think there is a tremendous amount to be optimistic about. And and I've already talked about some of the struggles and I talked about how things are, are lining up and the workers are leading, especially south of the border and especially amongst immigrant workers are leading and understanding, you know, the, the new realities and, and how that should inform how we organize. Um, but there's also movement in um, in in, the, in, in U.S. The sectors of, of U.S. organized labor, and and I want to give one example of the potential power we have 
to, to bring to this system to its needs, right? Um, and 2019, in the early part of the year, um, the Trump administration was in a budget fight with, uh, over the question of $5 billion to expand the border wall. That was the flagship issue of, uh, the, the, of the Trump regime, right, was to build the wall. And um, there was a lot of opposition. It's important to bring in, you know, the fact that a lot of public opinion is not, you know, um, against immigration or immigrants. Um, it has consistently, there's been consistent support for legalization, even amidst, you know, a universal criminalization regime, um, you know, coming from, coming from um, Washington and, and through the state houses. Um, so there was a lot of opposition to bu Trump building his wall in terms of the, getting the funding through Congress and it registered in Congress. And there was this budget impasse where Trump shut down the federal government. I think people will, may remember it, uh, especially if you were a federal worker because you weren't getting paid for about two months, right? Um, and in the impasse over the, the federal government shutdown, um, it was interesting to watch how um, some sectors of organized labor stepped in. Um, and the, the example that I would give that really, I think, illustrates the, the potential to, to force, to, to bring down the border regime uh, was when um, Sarah Nelson, the president of the uh, uh, Association of Flight Attendants, um, uh, which is part of CWA, the Communication Workers of America, um, you know, who, who has taken a very, you know, who has overt, you know, been very overt in terms of the need for labor solidarity and labor militancy since, you know, since becoming the president of that, of that union, uh, entered into the, into the fray against Trump because the border shutdown was, was leading to, um, funding, you know, no funds coming into airport workers. It was, it was leading to different types of, uh, abstentionism and, and, and basically the airport, the airports themselves becoming dysfunctional. And she came in and said, um, essentially uniting, um, various, um, groups of wor airport workers behind and airline workers behind her saying, if Trump, if Trump continues this, um, impasse, we're, we're going to call for a general strike of air airline, of airport workers. We're going to shut down the airports. And what happened? Trump within 24 hours completely retreated and gave up on his, his signature, the signature campaign promise. And there was no general strike because because the next day it was resolved and funding, you know, government federal funding was re reinstituted and Trump didn't get his five billion. Um, but it shows that like our potential power, right? Our potential power to 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 back down the most, um, you know, the most you know um, authoritarian and and aggressive representatives of of capital and 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 you know uh, and the border regime and you know the everything that comes with that. And imagine what we could do if we actually organized with that in mind, with the ability to, to be in solidarity with undocumented people, with people across the border. But more importantly, there, if we don't, we're gonna see a continued decline, a decline of our unions. We're gonna see a continued um, increase in the migra state. This, this, this monster is gonna continue to grow um, and it's gonna continue to consume, uh, you know, Every, everybody uh, you know around it, not just undocumented people, um, because that's the trajectory that we're already that we're already in. So um, so it is a matter of rebuilding labor. It is a matter of human rights and justice. Is it a it is a matter of international solidarity? Um, you know, but it, it's in all of our interests, um, and so we have to you know we really recognize that and, and and immerse ourselves in that struggle because that is the struggle of today and that is the struggle of tomorrow. Thank you, Justin. Yanni, in a few sentences, what's the case? I mean, everything Justin said, but I would just add, you were just saying it towards the end, right? Um, opening the borders is a Black Lives Matter issue. It's a gender equality issue. It's a, you know, decarceration, um, pol abolishment of police issue. It's a labor issue, you know, because opening the borders, as you said, it, it's about control of people. It is about devaluing people and their labor um, and exploitation of people. And if we're serious about building, um, you know, un unworlding this world, right, and, and building a world um, where we are free, a socialist world, um, then we have to make infuse this, you know, the, the argument of opening the borders and everything that we do 
it is essential. And when we're looking at how can we better our living conditions and what are our demands, we always have to think about who are the people at the lowest of the low? Who are the people that are the most oppressed, the most exploited? And start from there. And so I think that if, if we're looking at our organizing like that, then there's no reason why we can't be fighting for open borders. I mean, it's essential. And, and we need to have an anti-imperialist, right? Um, uh, perspective and politics, and we need to have, um, a, you know, um, an international solidarity perspective. So that, that's really w- what I what I think. Thank you so much. So thanks again to Justin and Yanni for joining us, and thanks for having me. Thanks for Haymarket inviting me to moderate. It's been a, an honor and a pleasure. And I know there was last thing. I know like we're losing people, but last, last, last thing. I know that there was one um, call to action right? A day of action. Mm-hmm. Yes. So um, I encourage everyone to go to uh, no more deportations. Let me get this right. Uh, .org. Um, no more deportations .org. That's one, you know, one URL, no spaces. And um, in, in that website, you'll find there's a call for a national day of protest. For October 14th, happening, uh, they're going to be happening around the country um, in solidarity with Haitian people to oppose uh, deportations of Haitians. Um, and this is, you know, this is the most recent and most urgent um, manifestation of this Migra state attacking um, uh, Haitian refugees. Um, so please, please check that out. Please get involved and, you know, be part of the struggle. And that's it for us. And we're off. Thank you.